So I, I was uh, uh, originally planning on starting a new series this week, and then we were looking at the calendar and, and decided that it'd be best if I held that off one more week. So make sure you come back next week. I got something I'm excited to talk about next week. So this, this kind of came up as a, a sort of surprise, uh, this, this kind of one standalone sermon. And then this morning it came in, and uh, we had some worship leaders out, so I somehow ended up on the stage. <laughs> Gary wasn't supposed to be on the stage. He ended up on the stage, so we pulled it together last minute. And so it's exciting to see what God's doing, because sometimes you don't even know right before it happens. <laughs> well, last week I talked about canyons, uh, one of those, you know, natural wonders and the beauty of the earth. And uh, so I'm going to follow it up with icebergs. <laughs> I was like, hey, I got to come, I got to pull together a sermon. What am I going to talk about? I talked about canyons. How about icebergs? Now, the reason I want to talk about icebergs is there's something very interesting about icebergs. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but when I heard it, it really surprised me. And here, here it is. The fact is that only 10% of the iceberg is above the surface. 90% of most icebergs are actually below the surface. Did you guys know this? Okay, good. I was just the only one that was surprised by that. Like, uh, no, we were all smart. You're just the dummy. I was like, whoa, what? Like, I knew it went down. I knew, like, I knew it was below the surface, but I didn't know that 90% of it, like most of it, was below the surface. I didn't quite know about that. Well, I'm going to come back to why that was significant in a, in a moment. But first, speaking of icebergs, I don't know about you, but I was a kid raised in the 90s. Any time I think of icebergs, I think of Titanic. You guys are... Yeah, there was a movie. It was something that really happened. Uh, the reason that was 90s is because the movie came out. Anyone remember when the movie came out? It was a very big deal. It was going to be visually impressive. I remember as, as a, a young guy in school, everyone was like, you know, did you see it? Did you see it? I finally got to see it. My parents, you know, covered my eyes for two parts of the movie. I, I still don't know what happens in those two points. I'm getting suspicious that it might have been... I don't know, though. <laughs> Still haven't seen those parts of the movie 15 years later. Well, that movie, <laughs> Titanic, came out. Anyone remember? Did, how about Blockbuster? Did anyone go to rent that movie from the Blockbuster? Ooh, I remember going to Blockbuster as a kid. Ooh. Now, Titanic was such a big deal. It was on, who remembers, two VHS tapes. You guys remember that? <laughs> You remember that? You had to watch half of the movie and then switch the VHS tape and put the second one in. And then you had to rewind both of those suckers before you brought them back to Blockbuster. You're going to get fined for that. Anyone remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Going to Blockbuster as a kid was, was, a, was a blast. Another interesting fact about Titanic. Uh, my Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion is the best song ever written. That's just a, a fact. So I thought that was an interesting fact that cannot be disputed. Now, now uh, Titanic was, uh, the, the ship was originally dubbed the unsinkable ship, a title it did not hold on to for very long. Uh, now, the, the, it was a very luxurious shrimp, sh shrimp, not a shrimp. It was a big, big... <laughs> Aluminum, linoleum, linoleum, aluminum, aluminum, linoleum, linoleum, aluminum. I got to do my, my warm-ups before I get up here. Ooh, okay. We're back. Luxurious ship. It was a luxurious ship. Luckily, I said shrimp and not another word. That could have, could have been real rough. Uh, when it starts with the SH, you got to be careful. So, uh, shrimp. Ship, ship, a luxurious ship. And on its mated voyage, it had a very uh, prestigious group of passengers, this, this incredible ship, unlike anything that ever come before it. And uh, there, there's a, this, another interesting fact that I learned about the Titanic was that there was a cabinet where they kept binoculars for the lookout. But before the maiden voyage, the guy left with the key in his pocket and didn't put the key back. So... The, the, the lookouts were without binoculars the whole time. So their lookout was just a guy standing on the ship saying, look out. So, <laughs> and they had a whole cabinet of binoculars that they didn't use. Uh, I remember hearing that. That was another thing that blew my mind. So the Titanic, obviously we all know the ship, the unsinkable ship that eventually went down. Now, when the lookout saw the iceberg in the distance, he shouted out, and they quickly tried to turn the ship, and they actually avoided the iceberg. They kind of bumped and grazed along the side of it, and they thought, whew, that was a close call. 
But remember, we were talking about how 90% of the iceberg is actually below the surface, and there was this jagged piece of the iceberg that actually put a big gash in the lower part of the ship. So when they first went right past it, everyone kind of had a sigh of relief. They thought they had avoided a tragedy, but actually it was what was below the surface that put the gash into the Titanic. There was 2,240 people aboard Titanic. Only 706 survived. Pretty wild. So going back to the iceberg part, why, why did this whole thing about icebergs and, and it being, uh, you know, only 10% of it being above the surface, 90% being below the surface. The reason that kind of stood out to me was I kind of think that a lot of times that's how we live our lives. We focus so much more on, on what's on the surface than what's below the surface. We spend so much time making sure that really the 10% of our lives that people see, uh, that, that it's put together and it looks nice. We spend so much time and energy focusing on, on the image and, and, and making sure that it looks like that my, my family, we all have it together and we all, we all kind of put on the, the, the church face and we look like we got it together or, or maybe, you know, making sure that we... We kind of almost paint this fantasy version of our lives on social media. We post the best pictures and we make it look like our lives are just so beautiful and clean and, and our family is you know, free of problems and our lives are good. And I think we spend so much time focusing on our image and the way that other people see us and the parts of our lives that are seen, sort of that 10%. And I think that that's sort of just human nature. That's what comes natural, right? We, we want to look like we have it together. We don't want to look like a mess. So we kind of put these faces on and we focus and clean up the 10%. But when we look to the Bible, we see that God really looks past the 10%. And he looks to the whole 100%. He looks to what's below the surface of what is in our hearts. And so just like an iceberg, the strength of the iceberg is not the 10% the, the, the of what was on the tip. That was not the point that took down the unseekable ship. It was what was below the surface. And I think the same is true in our lives, is that what is below the surface is really where our strength comes from. Now, don't just take my word from it. I'm just a guy. Let's look to the Bible this morning. If you have a Bible, you can open up to the book of 1 Samuel. That's where we're going to hang out this morning. And in the book of 1 Samuel, God is preparing Samuel to go and anoint the second king of Israel. Saul was Israel's first king, and at this point in the, series, in the story, he had been rejected by God. Saul was, was referred to as a king who was chosen by the people. If you remember, the, the people demanded a king, and, 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 and Saul, he had the look of the king. He was tall. He was strong. He was handsome. He was what you would picture as the ideal leader, the man that you would want to make your king. The 10% on the surface of Saul was great. He looked like that big, strong leader, the guy that you wanted. He's tall, he's strong, he's handsome. Let's make him our king. But it didn't take long for Saul to, to, to do things just slightly different than the way that God was asking him to. And he kind of falls out of the graces and he, he makes a couple decisions that were deal breakers for God. And so God sends Samuel to anoint the next king. And so Saul had his 10% together. But God saw the entire image. He saw all that was below the surface, and God had a new leader in mind that would look a little different, who had his priorities in a slightly different order, who his strength was not drawn from just the 10% that everyone had seen. This man's name was David. I'm sure you guys know. David was a man after God's own heart. That's what we hear about him in Scripture. It says that in 1 Samuel. It says that in Acts. It refers to him as a man after God's own heart. Now, he was obviously far from a perfect person. He made many mistakes, but he was a man after God's own heart. And I always thought that was such a cool title, a man after God's own heart. So Samuel is sent to this man named Jesse and is told that he's going to anoint one of Jesse's sons as the next king. And but God, before he sends him, gives him this little disclaimer. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, he says this. He says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
He's looking at what's below the surface. He's not just looking at what mankind looks at, and what people look at, at the 10%. Uh, he looks at the whole thing. He's looking at what's below the surface. He's looking at our hearts. And so it's such a funny disclaimer, like, hey, listen, all right, you're going to go anoint this, this, this next king. What, what is kind of tragic thing? But when you see him, don't think like that I've rejected him. Like, <laughs> what, a, what a sad warning. Can you imagine if he had to read this later on? Like, well, have you said that about me? You know, don't, don't consider his appearance or his height that I have rejected him. You know, like when you see him, you might question like, wait, God, hang on. Are we really in touch? Did I lose frequency here? This is, this is the next king? This kid is going to be the next king. Are you sure that I got this right? But he tells him, don't consider his appearance or his height that I've rejected him. I'm not looking at that 10%. I'm not looking just what's on the surface. I'm looking into his heart. I'm not looking at it in the way that man does. And so we see this right here in the, in the Old Testament throughout Scripture. In Proverbs verse uh, 21, verse 1, it says, All deeds are, are right in the sight of the doer, but the Lord weighs the heart talks about this old throughout the Old Testament, that, that God looks past the surface. He looks past just the performance and the way that things look from the outside. He looks deeper within. He looks into our hearts. And this is something that Jesus really doubled down on when he came. He said, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, but whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be li liable to the hell of fire. Later on, verse 27, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in, with her in his heart. So Jesus echoes these same things. That it's not just about the actions and, and the way that things look from the outside, but Jesus is looking at the whole being. He's looking at our hearts. He's not just looking at our actions and what, what we do. Sure, he does look at that, but he looks even deeper than that to what is in our hearts. So if I came out here and I murdered one of you guys, that would be everyone that would, everyone would see that, right? And you say, why did we hire that guy as our pastor? He's a terrible person. He is a murderer, right? We all, but if I'm up here and I secretly have some hate in my heart towards some of you guys, maybe not everyone sees that. That's not something that's apparent from the 10% of just looking at my life. But Jesus says, look, Zach, I'm looking past that. I'm looking just towards whether you decide to kill the guy or not. Sure, we should, don't, don't hear me wrong. We should definitely have self-control when we have anger and not kill someone. Okay, so scratch that. But, but he looks past just what's on the surface. He looks deep within our hearts, and he wants to deal with the deeper things. He sees that 90% of us that's below the surface, and he wants to deal with all all of it. So we're not fooling him with the 10% that's just on the top. And when Jesus came, we see that he doubles down on this theme that we've seen through, without scripture, and he tends to butt heads with the people who really focused on the 10%. Right? You had these Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the guys who, who knew the books, and they knew what their life was supposed to look like, and they did the things that they were supposed to do. And from the 10%, you'd look at them and say, wow, look, they do everything right. They're doing it right. These people are great. But then Jesus seemed to have the most conflict with you guys. He said, you brought of vipers. How can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, there's an importance of what happens below the surface because it comes out from our heart. Everything that we speak, it comes up and out from our heart. Luke 6, verse 45, it says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In Proverbs 10, verse 11, kick it back to the Old Testament again. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. So we see it over and over and over throughout Scripture that what's below the surface is what counts. What we store up in our hearts, what's happening below the surface in our life is important and that Jesus looks past the church face. 
none of us have fooled God with our Instagram accounts, okay? <laughs> he's looking right past it. He sees right through it, and he's looking deep within our hearts, and he sees our entire being. So going back to our story now, hopping back in. So Samuel goes to anoint one of Jesse's sons as the next king. He's been given this warning. Don't look at his height. Don't just look at his appearance and think this can't be the guy that I've rejected him. And so Samuel comes to Jesse. And so one by one, Jesse starts to bring his sons in front of Samuel. Is this the guy? Is this the guy? And so one by one, no, this is not the one that the Lord has chosen. This is not the one that the Lord has chosen. So we get to a point in the story where Jesse has brought out seven of his sons. And he's like, none of, none of them? It's not, I brought out seven of my sons and it's none of these guys. And, and Samuel says, no, is, is this all of your sons? And Jesse's like, well, I do have one more boy, but he's just a shepherd. He's out there, you know, keeping watch over the flock. And he says, go and grab that boy and go get him and bring him to me. And Jesse's like, uh, are, you, are you sure? You don't want to see the other seven guys again? I got some, some tall, strong. You want me to go get the one watching the sheep? Well, we're talking about a king here, right? You were going to anoint the king. You know, go and grab that boy and bring him to me. So they go and they, they bring up David out of the field. And the Lord says, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And so God was confident in his choice to make David the next king. But everyone else is kind of looking on like, Hang on, what's going on here? <laughs> this is so much different than what we would have expected. By looking at David, he didn't have the appearance of the king. We look at Saul, this strong, tall man. He is a, a natural-born leader. He'll lead us to victory. The, sh the shepherd boy, the one out there taking care of the sheep? Look, I mean, look at him. But God was confident in his choice, so he's anointed as the next king. Now, an important thing to remember is being anointed as the king does not instantly make you the king. David would actually go through a 15-year period before he would actually step into the throne and become the king. So he is anointed, but then he goes through these years before that, that was leading up to his reign. And so long before he arrived at the throne, God started the process of preparing him to take charge. So when he's anointed, he's not given any power. He's not given any, any, any authority over anything. He's just simply been anointed. And now during this, this 15 years, David goes on a bit of a roller coaster over this time. He slays Goliath. I'm sure you guys know that story. We'll dive into that a little bit later on. He win, fights and wins many, val, uh, many battles. He runs for his life from Saul. And he goes through this big roller coaster filled with up ups and downs. You guys have heard me talk about the story of Joseph, a story from scripture that I just absolutely love. And I think there's so many similarities from this story to that story. When you look at the story of Joseph, remember it starts with he receives this dream where he sees that he's going to be over his brothers. They would bow before him. He receives this dream, but it takes 14 years before that dream came to life. And in the same way, Joseph, as we all know, went on quite a roller coaster during his 14-year experience before he would come into power. He was, he was sold by his brothers. He's, he's sold into slavery. He's thrown in prison. He goes on this, this wild roller coaster that eventually brought him to the point where he reigns. And what I love is Psalms verse one of, uh, of chapter 105, verse 19 says this. and says, until the time came to fulfill his dream, Dream, the Lord tested Joseph's character. So Joseph received this dream, but then he goes through a 14 year period where he goes on this roller coaster, the ups and downs, and just things that seem to go from, from worse to worse to worse, where many times where he could have questioned God, he could have given up. His character was tested, and time and time through, he, time again, he comes through, he counts on God, he leans on God, and he perseveres until he eventually rises to take that power. And so David went through a very, very similar process. Now, when he finds out that he's been anointed, like, hey, I'm going to be the next king, I got to go get some Gucci clothes. I got to, you know, get a fresh haircut. I got to be looking good. I'm going to be the king. I need a new suit. I need to be looking nice. If people are going to be looking to me as their leader, you know, I got to start working out. 
No, that's, that's not what he did. Because God wasn't concerned with his image, and so David wasn't either. But instead, he, he, start, he started to dig deep to work on his inner self. And we see during this, this, this 15-year period that many of the things that, that Joseph went to has so many similarities to the story of David. Now, obviously, one of the biggest points in the story is when David fights Goliath, right? That's the story everyone loves. The little man taking on the champion, the war champion. Champion. I love that story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible because I love that he was the little man. I love that he was the underdog, that he had no business being there. So the, 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 the Philistines had gathered to have uh, this battle with the Israelites and out steps Goliath and says, hey, let's not get into this big bloody war and make a big mess. You just send out your best guy to fight me one on one. But the Israelites were filled with fear. They'd run and he'd come out day after day and taunt them and no one, no one in all of Israel, none of God's people would step up to face this enemy. He was a tough guy. He was the war champion. He had a bronze helmet, head to toe in bronze armor, a bronze spear on his back. He had a dude who carried his sword for him. I mean, this guy was intimidating. The giant, the war champion since his birth. He was a trained killer. And so everyone is in fear. What are we going to do? Well, out comes David, the, this guy who, who had no business being on a battlefield. The only reason he was even there is because his dad had sent some things to deliver to his brothers who happened to be there. And so he had no business even being on the battlefield, little, little shepherd boy. And he comes out and sees what's going on. And he questions, hey, what's going on here? And they tell him the story of this war champion, Goliath, and no one will rise up to face him. We're scared for our lives, and even to the point where the king has promised that anyone, anyone who will go and fight him will be made rich. They can marry his daughter. They'll never be, they have to pay taxes again in their lives. He's got this sweet deal, but no one, none of God's people will rise up to fight this guy. And David's like, I'll take him. People are like, good one, buddy. No, I don't know. This is a real war. This guy is a war champion. So eventually, they bring him to, to Saul, and, and they say, hey, this kid wants to fight the giant. Now, what would fill this little shepherd boy with the confidence to go out and face a war Hero. I mean, a giant. This, this, this is just a kid who spent his days looking after sheep. He's never been to a battlefield. He's the delivery boy. And now he's going to come and fight the giant that none of the soldiers are, are brave enough to go and face. How, how did a little shepherd boy have that courage? How did he find the strength to do it? Well, remember, he's been on this journey. He's been going through this process. He's been going through this testing, preparing him for what was to come. And so from the surface, it looked like there's no way we're going to send this kid out here. Everyone's looking at the 10%. This is a shepherd boy. We're, we got one shot at taking down this giant. We're not sending out a kid who takes care of sheep. And so we got to fight this war champion, but he's the only one with the courage who will go out to face him. Well, Joseph, David, David's care, his, uh, his courage did not come from the surface. He was channeling it from what was below, from, from, from how God has been working in his life, preparing him for his coming reign. So the, the story goes on and says this. First Samuel chapter 17. Uh, sorry, I skipped that part. Uh, David was prepared for the present because of his past. So... David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. 
this part's awesome. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Ooh, I love that. Oh, I love that. He's like, hey, you know what? Taking care of sheep's a little bit of big, bigger deal than I get credit for. You know, you think I'm just out there petting sheep like I'm in some sort of painting. No, this lion came out and tried to take the sheep. You know what I do? I took that lion down. A bear came out. And you know what I did? I took down the bear. It's like, whoo, you know, this. And now this guy who's openly an enemy of God's people. You think I'm going to be intimidated by him? No, no, no. Because the God who delivered me from the bear and from the lion will certainly deliver me here. I have seen God's character in my past, and so I know that he will be with me in the present. As I remind myself of who he was and how he's come through for me, I can, I can call on his character of who I know him, him to be. So his past has prepared him for the present. When people looked on, they're like, this doesn't make any sense. We can't send them out here. They're like, do you understand who you're going to face? Do you understand who you are? Do you have a mirror, buddy? Do you, like, are you in denial? Do you all see yourself as we do? But David was drawing on all that the Lord has, has, has done in his life, and he counts on who God is, and he calls to mind all the reason he has to have confidence in the Lord, and he goes out there and he slays the giant. How incredible. What an incredible story, this, 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 sh this shepherd boy who takes down a giant. Man, I love that story. So David found strength from what was below the surface. God has spent this time preparing him, sharpening him, testing him. Now, let's talk about hockey for a minute. Um, <laughs> we should really, we should really get like bingo cards for my sermons or something. Like, oh, he brought up, right? He brought up hockey again. We'll mark that off, right? Now, I don't just talk about hockey to remind you that the Panthers are still in first place in the whole league. <laughs> That's not why I bring it up. I want to talk about the great one, Wayne Gretzky. How many people know Wayne Gretzky? Now, and you know, in some sports, there's the debate of who the greatest of all time is. But in hockey, we all know the great one is Wayne Gretzky. Now, growing up as a kid who loved hockey, I, I studied Wayne Gretzky. I read books about him that I got from the library. I wanted to learn how did he become the great one. And when you watch back videos uh, of Gretzky, he, he had so many points. And just it was incredible, like, all that he did. And people would say things like, oh, the puck always finds Gretzky stick. He, he always just seems to be in the right place at the right time. Someone would take a shot and it would just bounce onto Gretzky's, Gretzky's stick and he'd hit it in the open net. He just seemed like the luckiest guy in the world. He was always in the right place at the right time. And so people would say things like that. But through my study of Wayne Gretzky, what I found out was as a kid, he would obviously watch a lot of hockey games. But what he would do is he would sit there with a pad of paper and a pencil. And everywhere the puck went, he would draw it on the paper. Just throughout the game, he would just trace the puck. And then after the game, he would study his piece of paper. He would study when they shot it from here, the puck went here. When they, took the, when they dumped it in here, it bounced out here. And so Wayne Gretzky, when he played hockey, he was almost like a prophet. Like he would just seem, the puck would just bounce towards him. It just always, the puck always found Gretzky. But it wasn't because he was a prophet. It was because he put this work in of studying the game. He had this unmatched work ethic. Now, Gretzky was not this freak of nature that was just bigger than everyone. He wasn't faster than everyone. He just had this IQ of the game from studying the game, from watching it, through tracing that game over and over again, that he seemed to play in almost a prophetic way. He knew where to be, and he always found himself in the right position. Now, Gretzky did not just stumble onto the ice and become the greatest player in the world. It came from years of studying the game, of putting these things into practice. And so what Wayne Gretzky did in the past 
prepared him to be that player, that player that was smarter than everyone else because he spent more time studying the game than everyone else. It wasn't just on the 10%. Wayne Gretzky was just this freak of nature. No one could beat him. It was the 90% that no one saw, the study that he put in, the work that he would put in off the ice, all he did with his mind. Because what you practice gets reproduced right? What you practice gets reproduced. When you're a football team and you go out there, you practice the plays, that's because you want to go out there and run the plays during the game and have success. What you practice is what you reproduce. Now, does anyone watch like those unsolved mystery shows? Yeah, okay, no one's going to admit to it, but I know you do. Uh, so I, I love those shows, like the unsolved mysteries. What happened? How, well, how did this possibly happen? I want to help you guys. I want you to see if you guys can help me uh, with some unsolved mysteries, okay? First one, how did you get here this morning? Okay, by car. So how many people took a car here? Wasn't really a mystery, right? Everyone knew how they got here this morning. Now, the reason I asked that silly, goofy question, because a lot of times in life, I feel like we make mysteries out of things that are not quite mysteries, okay? Now, there is a second mystery that I really hope that you guys can help me with this one. And the mystery is, why don't I look like Hugh Jackman? <laughs> Anyone know? Like, why don't I look like Hugh Jackman? Like, I, I want to look like him, and I just don't understand why I don't look like that. No, can anyone help me solve that mystery? <laughs> well, the, it's not a mystery, everybody. It's because my shirt. Oh, yeah, you know, if I took this shirt off, I'd look just like that. But, you know, it's not really the proper time. No. <laughs> Spoiler alert, when I take the shirt off, I don't look like that, unfortunately. No matter how much I want to look like Hugh Jackman, I don't look like Hugh Jackman. Now, it's not a mystery. Here's why. Because my past, the decisions I have made in the past, have not brought me to a present where I look like Hugh Jackman, right? I have not put in the time of working out in the gym and eating healthy and devoting myself to fitness to get myself to a present where I look like Hugh Jackman. The decisions I have made in my past have not brought me to a present where I look like Hugh Jackman. You know what? I have a great example of this. The other day, my mom made spaghetti, and we sit down around the table, and she says something just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. She says, you know, I was going to make garlic bread, but I didn't for you, Zach. <laughs> and I said, what? Like, you said you, you didn't make garlic bread because of me? And she said, yeah, well, you said that you wanted to eat healthier. I said, Mom, are you kidding me? I said I wanted to eat healthier, not that I was actually going to do it. I said I wanted to do it. Of course I want to eat healthier. Of course I want to look like Hugh Jackman. But the decisions I've made have not brought me to that point. Now, the reason I bring up this, this ridiculousness is because I think that sometimes maybe we look at ourselves and where we're at, or we look at our circumstances, or we, we look at where we're at, and we're like, God, how did this happen? How did I get here? And sometimes it might not always be a mystery. A lot of times we can look back and see a trail of exactly how, I'm sorry if this is blunt, but sometimes we we can look back and see a trail of exactly how we got to where we were. Because the past leads us to where we are in the present. Our past will prepare us for the, 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 the things in the present. So David, he didn't just rise up and just, all of a sudden I have this courage out of nowhere. All of a sudden I trust God so much. I'll go and fight this giant. No, it was because of his past, because of the things that he's been through, through diving deeper in his trust from God, through seeing how God had pulled through for him with the lion and with the bear. And now it brings him to a point in the present where he has the courage that no one else does. If you will do today what other people are unwilling to do, tomorrow you will be able to do things that other people are not able to do, yeah. right? If we are willing to make sacrifices today to tr learn to trust God, to dive deeper into our relationship with him, to dive deeper into the word, to go deeper into prayer, then tomorrow we will reap the benefits of that. 
So what we put into practice in the present will prepare us for the future, right? So, so what we have done in the past will bring us to the present. And in the same way, the practices of the present will prepare us for our future. So David was not just simply given the throne. He went on this roller coaster where the Lord tested him, just like, just like Joseph went through I'll call back to this verse that the Lord tested him. Now that word testing, I think is kind of like almost like an icky word, like testing, like, I don't know. But but the thing that a lot of times I think we get it tricked up with with temptation, like, oh, I I was tempted, so I got to overcome my temptation. But temptation and testing are two totally different things. Like the Lord does not tempt us, right? Temptation comes from the enemy because temptation is something that's presented in the hopes that we fail, right? But a test, a test is something that's given with the hope that you pass it, right? You went to school and they give you a test and hopefully you didn't have an evil teacher that's just like, oh, I, I hope they all fail. No, your, your teacher's job is to help, you know, make you smarter to get that knowledge so that you can pass the test and move on, right? And I think that, that, that this testing is something that we're probably familiar with you went through school you went through fifth grade and you tested out and you moved on to sixth grade I got to tell a terrible story I I got a, a you know a bible degree I still had to do math classes like isn't what kind of what kind of world is this now I remember I remember looking uh, good one I remember looking towards college with like, oh, I cannot wait for the days when, 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 when math is a thing of the past. And for my college degree, I only needed one math class. Yes, college algebra. I just got to do that, that one class and I am done with math forever. Well, college time comes around and I'm registering for my classes and they told me that I had to do not one, but two remedial math classes before I got into my college algebra class. <sighs> I'm like, are you kidding me? So I had to do introduction to algebra first. So, okay, so I go through a, a whole semester of introduction to algebra, and then I get into intermediate algebra. I'm like, okay, I got this. Like, I just got to do this one more, and then I can do my class. Well, I get to the final and I don't get a good enough grade. I worked so hard, I worked my tail off, like I just wanna be done with math, and I just failed the class. So then I had to do intermediate algebra again. Ah! And then I finally passed it, and then I had to do college algebra. I thought I had to do one more semester, uh, one semester of, of math and be done with it, and I ended up taking two years just to get credit for my one class that I needed. And I remember like going through that process of the Lord, is testing me, right? Well, I was getting a lot of math tests. So it wasn't that I was dumb. It wasn't that I wasn't working hard. Believe me, I worked my tail off to fail that class. I worked, I worked so hard. I worked so hard. But I just had to develop those skills and get through it. So if you're in a period in life where maybe you feel stuck or you feel stagnant, you just feel like, God, why, why haven't things changed? Like, why haven't we moved on yet? Maybe Maybe God is sharpening you in this moment to prepare you for what's next, right? He didn't just say, hey, David, I see your heart. You're a great guy. Come be the king. Hey, Joseph, I know that you're a great guy. Come, come take over. I need you in charge here. No, no, no. 14 years, 15 years, these guys went through a roller coaster of testing of God preparing them for what was next. And so if we find ourselves in these moments, let's draw near to God. In this moment today, in the present, we have the opportunity to prepare ourselves for the future. And it might seem simple, but the question is, what are you putting into practice today to prepare yourself for tomorrow? If Goliath is waiting down the road, are you preparing yourself today to be the one that steps up that says, hey, I'll take him because of what I've been doing in my personal life of focusing on what's below the surface, I'm ready to slay the giant. God, pick me, choose me. It's as simple as diving into his word. 
It's as simple as going and connecting with him in prayer, to getting alone, shutting away the distractions, and just being with God. Like we talked about last week, laying all the cards on the table. We can be open and honest of what we're going through. We can bring all of it to him. Have you guys seen the movie Evan Almighty? Okay, so I just watched this movie the first time this week, and my kids actually watched it without me with the grandparents. They're like, you got to see this movie. And, I, you know, it's like it's got Bible stuff. And I'm like, how biblical is this movie going to be? You know, there can't be another global flood. But there, it was, and the movie was actually pretty cute. But there's this moment that really stood out to me. At the beginning of the movie, uh, the, 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 the kids asked to pray. And, and the thing that the mom prayed for was for their family to grow closer. And so then the guy starts, to, the husband starts to build this ark and things get rocky with this job and all this stuff and she gets to a point where she's like I can't do this anymore this is just too crazy and she leaves well she ends up bumping in to God and God is a, a waiter at a restaurant he doesn't say that he was God but he has this conversation with her and and it's, it's this really cute conversation and and she's telling him this story of like my husband and then like how you know crazy he's going through this building an ark and God says to her, he says, you know what? I have a question for you. How, how, do you think if someone prayed for patience that God would just give them patience? Or do you think that God would give them opportunities to be patient? And if someone prayed for courage, do you think that God would just load them up with courage? Or do you think that God would present them with opportunities to be courageous? And then he says... And suppose someone prayed for their family to grow closer together. Do you think that he would just make their family closer or give them opportunities to grow closer as a family? I thought that was kind of cute. But we have God right there. We can enter right before into his presence. We could go to him and just worship him. We can go to him in prayer. And in these moments, we can put into practice the things in his word. We can begin to sharpen ourselves for the future. Our past has prepared us to where, for where we are today, and the things that we put into practice in the present will prepare us for the future. So the question is today, what are you putting into practice because Goliath might be waiting down the road and if you want to be the one that steps up and says God use me I will be the one to face him we got to put it into practice today let me pray for us Jesus we love you and God we thank you for who you are and God we thank you for the access that we have to you that you are always with us you're always willing to hear from us we have your word to guide us. So God, I pray that we would be intentional about going to your word, that we would read it, that we would meditate on it, and God, that we would put it into practice in our lives. That God, that we would come to you in prayer and share the depths of our hearts, that we would hold nothing back, that we would open up and just lay it all out with you, that we would develop a deeper and more real relationship with you. God, I pray that, that, we, that we would take advantage of this body of Christ that we all belong to, that, God, we would, that we would dive in, that we wouldn't just simply attend, but we would connect with this community. We would look for opportunities to be sharpened by each other, that we would look for opportunities to use our gifts so that, God, through putting these things into practice, we would dive deeper and deeper into a faith and trust in you, that when we one day face Goliath, we would be filled with confidence to draw on from the past, knowing that our past prepares us for the present and that what we put into practice in the present will prepare us for the future. So, Lord, we turn to you today, knowing it is an opportunity that is given to us to connect with you. God, we love you, and we thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.